Hello everybody, this is Havoc collaborating with Creative Assembly to bring you the upcoming major 1.6 patch for Total War 3 Kingdoms, which arrives right alongside the Furious Wild DLC. As with any update alongside a DLC, there is a lot to cover even for those who do not buy it. Let's walk through what's coming in patch 1.6 with some pretty big improvements from new campaign features, units, characters, and more. Let's dive in. Free LC, she she. It's always best to start off with the free LC coming alongside a DLC, and for this one, it's the arrival of Shi Shi. As the historical governor of the southern Chinese Zhao province, his rise to power came from a deep noble lineage and a notorious ability to sway powerful leader through well-timed gifts. This allowed him to rule with little influence from the Han government and, conveniently, away from most of the internal conflicts during the Han's collapse. His acumen for cunning and charm plays well into his two unique faction mechanics, Splendor and Tribute Chest. Splendor can be gained by smuggling his own family members into important positions within another faction's courts, such as administrators, ministers, and even faction leaders. The higher your Splendor is, the more benefits you receive for your faction, from increased trade influence to character satisfaction in public order. Shi Shu's second mechanic, Tribute Chest, lets you spend your Splendor to buy chests containing special ancillaries that grant character bonuses. These equipable items grant buffs in areas of diplomacy, economy, and personal character development that last 20 turns, and they can be traded to sweeten any deal during your campaign. Shi Shu has many family members at the start of his campaign, including his three brothers Shi Yi, Shi Hui, and Shi Wu, as well as his five sons. So many family members will open up several opportunities to plant them in the hopes of gaining splendor. If that wasn't enough, the cost of adoption and marriage into Shi Shi's family is half, giving further incentive to expand your family network to play towards that mechanic. Front End Rework As unique and impressive the Front End Faction selection screen is for Three Kingdoms, the addition of multiple start dates made it clunky and difficult to navigate. Until now. The front end rework has simplified the entire process, combining faction selection with start dates into a single screen, including the ability to search for your favorite character in the bottom search menu. To give a better understanding of faction groupings and the influential characters around them, you can click on any start date and to the left side menu you'll see what characters are available and which are not, as well as their character grouping, even if it changes from different start dates. Also on selecting a character, you will see a backdrop of their noteworthy characters surrounding your selection, helping to tell a little bit about their story and what you are headed into. Lastly, because the map is so daggum big, when you select a faction, you can choose to show the map, which now allows you to zoom in and out to get a better idea of the characters and lands surrounding your own on the campaign start in detail. Map Update with the addition of the Nanmen tribes, there is a huge opportunity to revamp the entire world map and make some key changes to open up territories for the Barbarians and accommodate a pretty intense new feature to Three Kingdoms, which we'll tackle in the next section. Among those changes are unique names for every single region of the map, large expansions of land to the south and southwest, and a few large areas to the very northeast to cater to the Nanmen. New commandery makeups. Some regions have lost a settlement, going down from 3 to 2 in Pengcheng, for example. Typically speaking, southern regions will be fewer in number, while more populated areas to the north will have more. Resource and Geographical Changes Due to changes in the commanderies, resources have been added or removed, and with more mountainous terrain in the south, to allow the Nanmen to more easily defend large areas of land effectively. These changes will add some flavor and a tad more complexity overall to your campaigns, regardless of which faction you start with. Gate Pass Battles That's right, a rather massive part to this overall map update and design of Three Kingdoms in general is a new battle map in Gate Pass Battles. Consisting of nine single region commanderies that can be occupied by any faction across the campaign, when attacked it sets up a pretty epic defensive battle for control of the region. These various geographical choke points only have two sides of attack, depending on which direction the attacking enemy is coming from. With heavily fortified walls complete with gatehouses, bastions, and towers, gate pass battles will no doubt cost any attacker some serious casualties and are not for the faint of heart nor cautious strategists. New Characters 
While not nearly as extensive as the 1.5 patch update, the 1.6 comes with three new characters. Wei Yan, a fearsome and vengeful warrior most well known for joining Liu Bu from Liu Jiang in 214 AD and his participation in the Southern Campaigns. Wei Yan has the Reckless Strike ability that deals a hefty amount of damage but can also damage himself and leave him open to enemy attacks. Xun Yu, Xun Yu was a powerful political figure in the capital at the time of Dong Zhou's rise to power, and supposedly he secretly plotted to have Dong Zhou assassinated. He has the Ancient Wisdom ability, that means he can see across the battlefield and through forests increasing the vision of any army. Li Ru Li Ru was an advisor to Dong Zhuo and was instrumental in convincing Dong Zhuo to bring Lu Bu to his side. Li Ru has the special ability Hold Firm, which improves his melee evasion when he is engaged in melee combat. This is a passive ability that improves over time. New Unit Juggernauts The Juggernauts are a dramatic, some might even say combustive, unit. A fearsome foe on any battlefield, this short-range artillery unit does come with some drawbacks. They may be able to wipe out men at close range, but getting them in position can be a challenge as they're slow to reach their mark. Luckily enough, they are pretty well protected from missile fire, but they are the epitome of glass cannons, as they have bad morale and are very vulnerable once in melee combat. All of that considering, they are a pretty dang sweet sight to see in Three Kingdoms, but please, please protect them from the enemy as much as you can. Balance Changes When it comes to balance changes, I don't believe anything in Three Kingdoms hasn't been touched in this 1.6 patch, so let's start with character and faction changes. In an effort to increase the variety and focus of how all of the factions play, there are some big changes to many of the bonuses that the most played faction leaders give through their career traits, and an increase to the number of bonuses those career traits give. There's also some faction unique buildings and resources that have been switched up as well. We don't have time to go over every single one, so we'll look at Cao Cao as our primary example, who has been reworked to emphasize his own strategic strength. His old traits give him reduced upkeep to cav and increased supplies. Now, he has two more available spy slots, reduced redeployment costs for armies, and reduced recruitment costs for cav. On top of that, his Tunshin conscription gives bonus movement range for armies in the province, reduced cost of all agricultural garrison buildings, and a bonus to food production at all levels. Nearly all of the faction leaders experience the same level of rework in this patch, so it is well worth reading the official patch notes. The link is in the description. In terms of campaign-wide balance changes, there are only a few, but it's still worth a look. The 1.6 patch changes how the Emperor income works, lowering the Emperor's income from their subjects and decreasing the amount they pay back. This is in the hope that Emperors of smaller empires do not have their economy sucked dry, while also incentivizing becoming an Emperor. Faction-wide food surplus bonuses were inconsistent across the difficulty levels, with normal having worse modifiers to reserves than legendary, but higher bonuses to peasantry income than easy. Now, bonuses from faction-wide surpluses have been unified across all difficulties, while penalties for being in the negative will remain unchanged. And lastly, for those playing the Mandate of Heaven DLC, Emperor Lu Hong's initial starting treasury has been reduced from 100,000 to 45,000 to reflect those new changes in income. Next up is the Bandit Network, which sees some mechanics and features moved around to cater to the arrival of the non-men from the DLC. As bandits, should you expand into non-men territory, you will now be able to recruit non-man units instead of Han Chinese units. And as for Bandit Faction Technologies, new ones have arrived with the non-men as well as several moving around to reflect those new regions, with only a few being removed completely to limit the rosters available to the bandit faction. Our final balance changes occur with battles and units. Ambush battles have changed in behavior a bit. Previously, archers would start with fire at will on, but would not fire until the player gave an attack order. Now, they will start with fire at will off, but will open fire at any units in range once it is switched on. The balancing of archers and cav is still ongoing from patch 1.5, with crossbowmen receiving greater range to counterbalance their reduced shooting arc. Missile bonuses versus cav have also been bumped up from 45 to 52, making archers just a bit more powerful against cavalry. That being said, both normal and heavy tiger and leopard cav 
have received a big boost to armor to better represent their visual armor, as well as getting recruitment costs and upkeep reductions to make them more viable of a unit choice. UI quality of life improvements. If you know me at all, I'm always in favor of improving the user interface of any game. These changes are small and few in number, but can have a pretty big impact for your campaigns in terms of quality of life. Beginning with events and missions, to help identify targets more effectively, target portraits and their faction flag will be available inside the mission box, a very nice subtle touch. The same goes for buildings and their icons. For accessibility, you can now create your own custom color profile and change the common colors, generally in the diplomacy area, to exact your own liking. Speaking of diplomacy, quick deals now show the total evaluation worth of a negotiation removing a need to switch back and forth between the real negotiation screen. On the campaign selection menu options, you now have the option to have timeless characters or characters that never die due to old age. If toggled, the age of the characters will be replaced with how many turns they've been alive. Two quick notes about this new option. Children will still show an age until they come of age, then shows turn alive, and timeless characters can still die in battle this only affects aging. Bug fixes. There's an immense number of bug fixes across diplomacy, characters, the campaign, UI, and units. Some are as minor as not showing faction ownership of cities on the campaign map, to units on a campaign map able to replenish while in water using forced march stance. There are of course way too many bug fixes to go over for this video, so I will once more defer to the actual patch notes that you can find in the description. Ladies and gentlemen, that will about do it for this extensive look at the 1.6 patch. There is a lot packed into this thanks to the arrival of the Nodmen, so be sure to check out the Furious Wild DLC on Steam with 10% off right now if you pre-order the game. Subscribe to Total War's channel to stay up to date with any new videos. This is Havoc, thanks for watching, and I hope we meet again.